Hello and welcome to Atlantic Conversations. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The Atlantic Fellowship Programme works with a diverse community of leaders around the world with a common commitment to fairer, healthier, more inclusive societies. Through its seven programmes focused on equity and healthcare, socio-economic equity and racial equity, the Atlantic Fellowships offer those leaders an opportunity to gain new perspectives and new colleagues while strengthening their confidence in their work for change. In each podcast, I'll be speaking to an Atlantic Fellow about their work and ambitions for a more just world. For this series, I travelled to Sao Paulo, Brazil, for the Global Brain Health Institute Annual Conference, where I caught up with a number of Atlantic Fellows. Today, I'm joined by monologuist and filmmaker Josh Kornbluth, an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health. I was curious as to what had sparked Josh's interest in Alzheimer's and dementia. I do comedic monologues. I perform these two-hour-long shows in theaters. I was interested in dementia. We all are. It's the shadow that hangs over all of us. But it wasn't anything that I thought I would explore or know about in any detail. And then a couple of friends of mine had been visiting artists at the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF, run by Bruce Miller. And so I sent an email just out of the blue saying, can I apply to be a visiting artist? And when I went there, he said, well, we already have a visiting artist, but we're just starting this new thing. It's Global Brain Health Institute, and you should definitely apply to be a fellow. And I said, well, I should be honest with you. I just don't know anything about neurology. Or I didn't even graduate from college, and I was really, really bad at science. And he goes, perfect. And I said also in my story, since my son was born, especially I've just noticed that I connect every subject that I cover in my monologues to social justice issues. And he said, that's great. You're checking off all the boxes. I tried to find a way that I was disqualified and I couldn't. So I applied and then I got in. So now I'm really, really interested in dementia. My own personal connection with it at the time was that my mother had remarried For the first time since she divorced my dad when I was a little kid, she had remarried this wonderful guy in Chicago named Frank Rosen, and he had gotten Alzheimer's. And he was dealing with that. My mom was dealing with him having it at that time. So it was very much on my mind. The Global Brain Health Institute obviously has fellows who are clinicians, researchers, scientists, doctors from the scientific medical field, but they also have artists such as yourself. And I'm a fellow, I'm a journalist. So a lot of this is also not just about the research into dementia prevention, but getting the message out about dementia prevention. And that's really where you step in with your videos. Yeah, it's true. I'm not necessarily always directly approaching the dementia head on because really what I'm trying to do, although it's in there, is to disseminate information about brain science and brain health, including, of course, the steps that you can take to try to ameliorate the danger of dementia. And I'm trying to connect those specifically in the videos I'm making with being better citizens on this planet. For me, when I was looking at those blobby brain images, I didn't know, I don't know if it was like this for you, but you you go to these talks and it's incomprehensible initially. It's like learning a new language. It really is. Now I hear things and I'm like, oh yeah, of course I know all about it and the tangles and the plaques. But at the time, I was looking at this blobby brain just when I was starting as a fellow. It was difficult to tell. Well, I couldn't couldn't at all. I couldn't at all. As a result, I really couldn't look at it for atrophies or anything. So I thought of this brain that I was looking at as a map that had political atrophies, like a map of America or a map of the world. I feel like in the world, in many places, including the country that I live in, we have what I would think of as a kind of political dimension that people aren't communicating in our brains. We have, of course, we have neural networks. And then in a democracy, if you take each of us citizens as neurons, we should be forming these networks in which all of us have input, all of us receive and send information. But it's blocked. There are all these blocks between people who think one way and people who think another way. And increasingly, there's very little connectivity or connective tissue between two sides of an argument. It could be argued in the United States. And this is where we get on to one of your videos on empathy and the whole point of empathy being the common denominator to help us connect with each other, regardless of our political views or dispositions. Yes, I want us to connect. That's my goal in life. Empathy is this imaginative leap that you make. We don't have to actually have a conversation. In order for me to be empathic with you or you to me, I only have to imagine, oh, she's sitting there. What must it be like to be her? It's an internal process, but it's a process that then situates me in relationship to other people. And has a physical impact on the brain. 
It actually changes your brain. I would say things and pretty much everything I said that I was intuiting that I hoped for turned out to be scientifically valid. When we use our empathy circuits, just like we use our muscles, when we exercise our empathy circuits by empathizing, they strengthen. And conversely, when we don't, they wither. And if they wither, what does that make us more likely to be susceptible to? I think much more susceptible to fundamentalisms, much more susceptible to extremism, acceptable to a lot of really bad isms. Because we're operating solely on an individual basis and not connecting, empathizing with another person. Individual, but also tribal, because you can have empathy. Frequently, people have empathy within their tribe, within their family, within their group, within their race, within whatever it is that they consider themselves part of, and then they elevate themselves above other groups. So they have empathy for others, but they don't include so many other people. I think the key is universal empathy. So it is a fact that if you practice empathy every day, and I'm going to ask you in a minute if you wouldn't mind demonstrating that for us. Well, it'll change your mindset, which it might will, have you know, an It will physically your change your mind. It will literally change your mind. That's my understanding. Some people might be better at or worse at it. I can practice the piano for years and still not be very good, but I still will reach whatever it is that I can reach as my maximum potential. So how would you suggest that we practice this? I think one great way to start is think of someone who really pisses you off. So it can be someone cutting you off if you're driving or someone not looking at you or someone mansplaining to you, whatever it is that's really irritating, and then have the response that you would normally have. And you feel yourself having this response, which is bad person, bad person, angry, but it's actually a really great opportunity because I think the best empathy exercises can be done with people who really piss you off. The people that you already love and like and you're really close to, you already empathize with. They already empathize with you. So find someone or run into someone, maybe literally, who gets you really upset or irritates you. This person now becomes in your mind the other. And what you want to do with empathy is you want to say, okay, well, why might this person have done this thing to me? It could be this person just got bad news, just got fired from his job. This person maybe is having some brain problems, whatever. And you don't have to be right. What you have to do is try to imagine what it is to be in the perspective of this other person who is so different from you. And if you are able to empathize with another person that you really don't like or really has rubbed you up the wrong way, even if they are really just a rude person, the fact of your brain, your mind trying to empathize what it might be like to be in their shoes literally changes your brain. Yes. Let me ask you about another video that you have done, which is about aging and attitudes towards aging. What is your take on the Western world and particularly the United States attitude towards aging? It's awful, and it is another and really pernicious kind of othering, putting people in this other category, a category that you look at them with pity or disdain, or that you more frequently, I think, with old people don't look at them. In the United States, we put them a lot in homes and sort of warehouse older people. And the thing about ageism as an ism, that particular kind of othering, is it's the one kind of othering that any of us, if we are fortunate, will be susceptible to later in life. We can't all be victims of racism, but we can be victims of ageism if we live long enough. It's not always the case across the world that there is this lack of empathy for aging people. But how do you think you can go about changing that view in the United States, for example? Well, what I try in the video, and I just took my cue from Rosemary Kenny At Trinity College. Yeah, at Trinity College. And she's the one who turned me on to all of this stuff. What I try to do is to start with this thing about if you don't think in an ageist way about your future self. Because interwoven with ages. And part of discriminating against people who are older is this fear about what you will be when you are older. I think that seems to be embedded in it. But it seems to me that that attitude has changed a lot in the last 20 years where people are keeping more physically fit. I don't know if fighting aging is the right term, but they're doing their best. If you were 40 back in the 1950s, you were definitely over the hill, whereas now 40 is the new 30. But then again, I was born in 59. I don't remember exactly what the attitudes towards aging were, and I was very young. But I feel that now, at least, there's this fetishization of youthful appearance, of seeming youthful. So people who are fortunate enough to prosper enough so that they have the right health care and nutrition, stuff like that, and no lead in their water, they tend to be healthier as they're older. And that's great. But I think there's something in that that's also going, I'm 
resisting the idea that I truly do age, that I am in fact aging, that I am mortal, that I am moving through time and that I'm deteriorating. So there's a distinction then to be made, are you suggesting, between fighting aging, not wanting to admit that you're a certain age, and accepting it while still living your best life. Yes. And one of the ways that I thought would be helpful with people that I put in my video to encourage them to think more positively about aging is from a study that Dr. Kenny alerted me to, which is that if you think good thoughts about getting older, you will live on average seven years longer. There's been a study out of Yale that shows that. So it's not just that you're living your best life, but you're living your best life seven years more. It's all in the mind. It's much in the mind. I think what we don't look at, if it's old people, if it's dementia, what we try not to look at, even though we can't help but be conscious of it, has this, I think, over time corrosive effect on us. And what I'm learning is that The corrosive effect occurs in large part in the brain and then from the brain to our muscular system and to our skeletal system and that interaction. So the way we think this conversation has rewired you and rewired me to a certain extent. When we're listening to stories, reading, when we're following narratives, that also has this rewiring effect and this empathic effect on us because if it's a good story, then the protagonist is someone that we're going to follow past and want to push past all these obstacles. And so in doing that, we're improving ourselves, literally. What's next for Josh Cornbluth? Loneliness is the next video. It's going to be on loneliness and isolation. Well, there's risk factors for dementia too, aren't there? A huge risk factor. All of these subjects to me, dementia, brain science, democracy, society, they all come down to connection and to making connections. And I think the fact that we feel lonely is itself a tribute to the fact that human beings are intrinsically social. If you're going to work together in groups and in tribes and in villages and in cities and countries, then you must empathize. You must. I think the West, though, and particularly the United States, does celebrate the individual to an extent that isn't in other societies. And I wonder if that sense of individualism hasn't contributed to loneliness within societies and communities. In the United States, at least, that would be my sense. There's this tension that there's always been in the United States, since it's been the United States, between individualism, the story of the citizen as the rugged individual, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and a feeling of collectivity, a really strong strain of we're all in this together, of social engagement and interaction. But currently, and maybe in my whole adult life, I think the needle has been way over to the individualist side. And that, among other ill effects, I think, the sense of loneliness. Why don't we just hold that thought until the next time we speak, when you'll have published the video, it'll be on YouTube, and we can discuss it in more detail and your future plans. Thank you. Thanks. That was Josh Kornbluth, Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health. For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to the Atlantic Conversations podcast.